so the title of this talk is Applied Domain Driven Design Blueprints for Java EE. Uh, as you can see, there's two different connecting ideas uh, in this talk. One is applied, uh, one is domain driven design. Uh, and how many people here have heard of domain dri driven design at least? Okay. Okay, so all, almost all of you, which is good news. Uh, and the other, other connector is Java EE. Okay, so the, the basic idea that I want to do is show you how you can write effective uh, domain-driven driven, uh, domain -driven design applications using Java EE in particular as an implementation. Uh, I'm actually a believer of both. I've, I've used Java EE for a very long time, and, and I've actually I've used uh, applied uh, domain-driven design for close to seven years now. Domain-driven design is about 10 years old, um, so I think I'm one of the early adopters of uh, domain-driven design. Okay, so a little bit of background first, uh, and uh, I, I happen to have an interest in architecture, so it's particularly important for me. Um, for those of you who have not seen that uh, the early 90s, you sort of can't visualize this, but in the early 90s, we really had server-side applications with no architecture whatsoever, and as scary as that sounds, right? So you really had a bunch of Java applications with uh, no, uh, nothing, no structure to it whatsoever. It's just a bunch of spaghetti code. Often, it was really embedded uh, servlets and JSPs with all kinds of code, you know, presentation logic, business logic, and persistence logic all in the same, literally one code base. So I have seen in, in my time, Back in that 80s, literally JSP files and serverless that are uh, close to 1,200, 1,500 lines long. Okay, can you imagine that for a second? So what changed that uh, was actually a very, very uh, innovative con concept that came out of Sun Microsystems called uh, the J2E Blueprints or, or the, or the, ja or the uh, Java Pet Store. And hopefully some of you have heard of this. Uh, so basically, what that project tried to do is actually bring some design patterns into server-side Java. Uh, and actually, that project has been wildly successful. Uh, we are still living with the legacy of the J2E blueprints, whether you re realize it or not. Um, although the blueprints themselves are probably not referenced um, as much uh, today, uh, the reality is those blueprints, the results of those blueprints is something that we, all, uh, we are all touched by. Um, so whether you realize it or not, uh, things like uh, DAO or data access object, things like facade, things like uh, DTOs, uh, all of those things actually originated from uh, the J2E blueprints. But uh, the J2E blueprints were not without their problems. Okay, the principal problem uh, with the J2E blueprints are not necessarily the blueprints projects themselves, uh, but rather the fact that the technology at that point in time was relatively immature. So the biggest drawback for uh, really the JTE blueprints is that actually it didn't allow you to do uh, the heart of what uh, object orientation is about. Object orientation at the end of the day is really about modeling uh, systems that mirror the problem domain that they are supposed to solve. Okay, so if you look at a, a software implementation of a banking system, the implementation should very, look very close, close to you know, a real life bank. A banker should be able to take a look at your objects and make sense of them. Okay, but, for, but uh, because of the reasons, the limitations of, um, of J2E at that point in time, that was not possible. You really couldn't do uh, rich domain modeling uh, with uh, the J2E, uh, J2E design patterns. And, and of course, uh, because this was uh, starting out, there was other things like, uh, I, I would say, a little bit of a design pattern bloat. So in totality, the J2E blueprints had about uh, uh, 40, or 40 or 50 some design patterns, which is quite a bit, okay? And in the end, we didn't wind up using that many. So we wound up really settling on, let's say, about 20 design patterns out of that. So uh, for me, uh, it was really very exciting when 10 years ago, uh, Eric Evans conceived this idea of domain-driven design. So what is really domain-driven design about? Uh, at the heart of it, domain-driven design is actually not new, believe it or not. The core concepts of domain-driven design have been with us, uh, has been with us since the 70s, okay? since the inception of object-oriented development. The basic idea is, is, is exactly uh, what, uh, what I stated previously. So the basic idea here is that your, uh, your uh, s software systems should model real life, okay? hence be driven by your domain. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, actually Java E as opposed to J2E uh, is actually a very nice natural fit 
for domain driven design. And I would say uh, the applications that I've written in Java E, I would say are very, very good examples uh, of domain driven, dr domain driven design. So it sort of all comes for full circle. The entire concept of, uh, of architecture in server side applications started with J2E, started in Sun Microsystems, uh, and started uh, with, the, with the pet store. But it all came back uh, sort of together with Java E uh, and a specific project that I will talk to you about uh, called Cargo Tracker. It's a project actually I started when I was still, uh, still at Oracle. By the way, the other thing I want to say is usually in my talks, I don't leave uh, QA time in, in the end. Uh, what I prefer to do is actually do Q&A throughout my, throughout my talk. Okay, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand uh, you know, and, and we'll discuss it. Believe it or not, if I don't go through my slides, I usually consider that, consider that a success. Okay, that's a sign that we've actually had a good session as opposed, to, as opposed to sort of a robotic session where I say a bunch of things and you sort of nod and, and go away. Okay. So this is uh, basically the canonical uh, image for domain-driven design. If you understand this particular diagram, you will actually understand what domain-driven design is all about. It's about a set of, set of concepts, it's a set of design patterns. Uh, and these are essentially the design patterns that you need to understand. So what I will try to do in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so is actually give you an 80% understanding of this of this, uh, of, of this diagram. If you do so, when you get out of this door, you will actually be able to say that you actually do know quite a bit about domain-driven design. Now, the one thing I will tell you is what I will present to you is my interpretation of what domain-driven design is based on my seven years of experience working with it. So it's more of a, of a real-world implementation. Okay, so don't expect my explanation to go match up with Eric Evans's. It, it's actually not going to. In fact, what I will advise you as practitioners of domain-driven design uh, is to not start with that project at all. Okay, and actually start with something more practical. Because believe it or not, it took me close to three years to understand what that book was actually trying to say. That book is extremely high level and ex extremely theoretical. Okay, so that's one of the, that's the applied part of my talk. Is this is a practitioner's real life, real life view of what domain driven design is. So each of these pieces that are on this uh, diagram helps you model a thing in the real world. So let's try to do those mappings. We'll start with the, mo the most important part of domain-driven design, and that is entities. And entities, uh, by, uh, transitively, are actually the most important part of your system as well. Specifically, what are entities? Uh, entities, lo the long and short of it, are the nouns of your system. So the most important, important things in your system. Things, nouns, in your system. Uh, entities will have three things. They will have a unique identity, okay? They will have data, okay? Modeling what the thing is, uh, and also behavior, okay? That's the most important thing. This is a thing that you couldn't do uh, in, the, in the J2E design patterns. Behavior, what does this thing actually do, all right? So I'll use an example of mine, or my own, to sort of explain domain-driven design. Uh, in particular, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, in insurance systems. Okay, so what are the most important uh, nouns in insurance systems? The important nouns are things like a policy, an insurance policy, uh, a member, a policyholder. Do we need to run out of this building? Is the building on fire? No? Okay, all right. All right. That's fine. All right. So, okay, so uh, yeah, things like the policy, Okay, uh, the beneficiary, uh, the member, uh, yeah, perhaps uh, th things like premiums. Okay, these are all things. You, these are obviously nouns in your system. And if you think about it, almost all of your systems have some nouns. Okay, uh, whichever system you're, you're dealing with, lar by and large, you're dealing with things in the real world. Okay, so these are going to be the core part of your system. If you took everything else away, the most important part of your system should be your entities. Uh, if you want to think about it in a different way, uh, entities sort of represent uh, your principal uh, database tables that you have in your database, uh, and each row will have a unique identifier and hence is actually an instance, an instance of one entity. Okay, so hopefully entities are fairly clear. A close relative uh, of an entity is a value object. 
Okay, a value object is also a thing or a noun in your system. But there's a core difference between uh, a entity and a value object. The core difference is that while entities have unique, unique identity, value objects do not. Okay, so value objects do have data, do have behavior, but they do not have identity. So, question to you, how can this something be useful if it does not have identity? Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an enterprise application. How, where does it get its identity from, usually? That's a separate, uh, uh, actually a separate concept called a DTO, or data transfer object. Value objects are not quite that. Can any, anybody guess it? These are also things. They're obviously important parts of the domain. Pardon? Not quite, yes sir. Somewhat. So value objects get their identity because they are uh, attached to entities. Okay? So let's think about value objects for a second. Uh, one of the core principles of object orientation is actually composition. Okay? So a thing is composed of other things. All right? So when something is composed of other things, it, the things that it is composed by actually do not, does not need it, an identity on its own. It can de derive its identity from its parent object, the thing that actually encapsulates it. Okay? So let's take uh, insurance as an example. So uh, in, an, in an insurance um, um, domain, a, a good example of a, a value object is an address. Okay? An address does not necessarily need to be uniquely identified. It's usually attached to a policyholder. A policyholder has an address. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. You'll actually see uh, more examples of this. I'll show you a few examples of this uh, in my example application. But this won't be too hard for you to fathom either. In most non-trivial non systems, you'll have these composition relationships, okay, where you'll have a value object and an entity. Okay, so the next one is something called an aggregate. And this is a little bit of a, of a complex one. And I will admit this is a little bit of religious, this is a bit religious as well. Okay, so I'd like you to think about, uh, I would like you to um, sort of uh, participate in a mental exercise with me. Okay, so think about your, the current system that you're working on and visualize uh, every single entity and value object in it for a second. Okay, uh, what you'll quickly find out uh, is that there is quite a lot of those. In most ER diagrams, you'll see 40 or 50 or 60 such entities. Okay, so they're quite difficult to uh, to comprehend right away. Okay, if you're to think of them as a flat structure, but in reality, uh, what happens uh, in modern in most systems is that actually these domain objects and uh, and entities have interrelationships with them. They're connected to each other in some way, and if you drew out all of those connections. Okay, in your, in your current system, what you will find out is that it looks like uh, a lot like a stellar constellation, okay, a, a, a star map, where uh, you will find uh, some entities are more closely interrelated to each other than others. Okay, so these are sort of constellations. Okay, these are these stars have constellations around them. Okay, so stars and planets. So it's a similar similar sort of idea. So each of these uh, constellations, if you will, uh, constitute an aggregate. Okay, and in most non-trivial systems, you will have one or more of these aggregates. Okay, uh, but these actually do not occur very naturally. You kind of have to think about them consciously, and they evolve over time, and the constellations sort of move around. Again, I'll show you this uh, not in just in terms of theory, but in practice uh, when we take a look at the example application. The next uh, design pattern in our sort of uh, catalog of core design patterns is something called a repository. Okay, and what is a repository? Well, uh, in a system, uh, in, in an enterprise system, things are in memory, right? When you load up an application, it's in memory. It has, it uh, perhaps keeps some state in memory. Uh, but what happens when this application shuts down and, re and gets restarted? Do we lose everything? No. Right? The reason we don't lose everything is generally these applications have some kind of persistent persistence back into them. 
right? Uh, and basically, a repository is nothing much more uh, than a way of abstracting away your persistence mechanism from your domain model. So this is the single responsibility principle, right? So you have your bu nice business domain, it models the real world application, and then you use the repository to abstract out uh, some infrastructure related concerns, namely, you know, your persistence code, whether it's JPA code or NoSQL code or what have you. Uh, and basically the repository's principal job in life is to model CRUD operations uh, on, on, uh, on an entities in particular. Now, I gave you gave away a little bit of a, of a magic word here. Now, if, you, if I say a repository, you're probably thinking it's very similar to a DAO, data access object. Can, you, can anyone tell me that has a little bit of familiarity with, with the domain-driven design, what the difference between a DAO and a repository is? Yes, sir. Okay, it's very close. It's a good enough explanation. Let me explain the, different, the difference. Uh, in traditional, let's say, J2E core, core blueprints type systems, you do have entities, and you actually do have value objects as well. Uh, and the DAOs in those systems actually match one-on-one -on -one to each entity and each value object. Okay? Per entity, you will have a, 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 a DAO of some kind. The difference... Um, in between repositories and DIOs is that repositories are aware of aggregation. Okay? It, they are very aware of the relationships between entities. So in, by and large, you actually will not find um, a repository mapping to every single entity. If you did that, you're probably actually doing J2E blueprints, okay? not necessarily domain-driven design. Uh, in a repository, what you will have in, instead is a repository per aggregate, okay? So uh, when you load up an aggregate, it will actually give you all of the relation, close relationships, the constellation, it, will oper it operates on groups of entities rather than specific entities, okay? So that's the big difference. Um, the other thing is factory. Factory is, is an easy one, okay? So in most cases, uh, when you create an entity or a value object, it's going to be as simple as creating a new operator and, and calling some set and getters and setters and that's it. Okay. However, that's not always the case. Okay. In some cases, your entities and value objects creation is going, to be is, is going to be relatively complex, especially when you're dealing with setting up an aggregate. Okay. So in those cases, you need some kind of abstraction to hide away you know, all of the complex logic that you need to create a, an aggregate or create an entity. Okay. And that's simply a factory. All right. Moving forward, we have services. And when I say services, what do you think of usually? Business logic, yes, correct. Mm -hmm. And maybe you think about REST web services or what have you. So this is the biggest difference. If there is one big difference, this is the biggest difference between domain-driven design uh, and, uh, and J2E blueprints. In J2E blueprints, the, the business logic actually is modeled through the business facade, which is really a service. Okay, so if you look at a business facade, it'll have do something, do the other thing, and that uh, in, inside of there is where you would expect your business logic to reside. Okay, and it will act upon uh, entities that are very stupid. They don't have any behavior. They simply have data. They're simply data holders. The difference here, okay, is that that is not where business logic resides in a domain in a domain-driven de design system. The business logic actually mostly resides in behaviors modeled by the entities and the value objects, okay? 99.9% .9 of the time. So then, tell me, what is the purpose of a service? What do you think is the purpose of a service if the business logic is not, not in entities? Yes, sir. Not quite, yeah. So anybody else want, want to take a guess? Yes, sir. 
that is a separate type of abstraction, which we'll talk about. Yes, that there, there is a, actually a design, another design pattern that deals with the concept of, uh, of collaboration between NTC, but this is not it. Yeah. Okay, I'll, uh, yes, sir. There you go. You, you, the second one, you got it almost right. Okay. So the reality is, uh, in, in most systems, uh, most systems are, are mostly composed of nouns, of things, okay, that do, that do, th do stuff. However, uh, in almost every system, there is at least one or more verb, okay, that is so important that it doesn't really belong as the behavior of an entity. It's actually a first-class citizen of the domain model on its own right. Okay, it is so important. So an example uh, in insurance domain would be underwriting, okay, to underwrite. Uh, what is underwriting? It's underwriting is basically determining, uh, given an individual, how much can you, can, what, how do the, does their policy look like? How do these premiums look like? It's a very complex bit of operation, and it's the heart of actually an insurance system, okay? So that thing actually cannot be modeled as a behavior of a thing. It's not a behavior of a policy. Okay? It's not a behavior of a policyholder. It is actually a verb on its own right. Okay? So these verbs will actually be modeled as services. So these are business logic, standalone bits of business logic that are very, very important. Every single uh, uh, application has them. So if you look at, for, for example, a logistics system, one of the most important one is going to be routing. Okay, how do you uh, route a bit of cargo and uh, via trucks, trains, and cars from one point to the other? Okay, and it is actually going to be uh, a service. So you should be cautious about this. Uh, you should use services with caution. You shouldn't overuse them. Okay, for the most part, your business logic does belong in entities and value objects. But you do have this construct. Okay, when you need it, you can use that construct, and the, that construct is a, one of a service. Okay. All right, and that's it. So l let me, uh, the rest of this, okay, uh, the most important uh, aspect of this is actually layered architectures, and I'll explain that in, in just one second. So uh, that is, if you understood this, okay, you have the basic tool set to create the heart of your domain-driven domain -driven design system. Okay, any questions on any of this? Before we move on to the next part. Yeah, very good. Yeah, another very good description. Yeah, it would be a, a distinct process, an important enough process that is a first-class citizen with the with the with your entities and domain domain objects. That's correct. Uh, value objects, rather. Sorry. Okay. Any other questions on any, on any of this? The core part of domain-driven design. Otherwise, we can move on. Okay. Moving on. So the other thing that you absolutely should understand. Uh, is layered architectures. Now, let me tell you, uh, there's, there's people that out there in the domain-driven design community that will tell you that layering is a bad thing, okay? We just do domain-driven design and that is all we need, okay? There, this uh, thinking is actually problematic. Uh, the reason it is problematic is when you, it, it's okay if, if you are designing, let's say, uh, an application with a few thousand lines of code and that's it. Okay, but when you are designing applications that approach, let's say, 100,000 lines of code or more than that, here's what happens. So uh, what happens is that you take your domain model and you, you start conflating it bigger and bigger. Okay? So the domain model uh, now becomes a, pla a place where you write business logic, uh, a, write a place where you hold data, a place where you put UI logic, and a place where you put persistence logic. Okay, and I have seen such systems. Uh, and that's why you need, you need these uh, separation of concerns via layer, layered architectures. That is not a situation you need to get into. Okay? You, the core of your domain model should really be very, very pure. Okay? Uh, in order to keep it maintainable, it should not have these other concerns. It should not have persistence concerns. It should not have UI concerns. It should not have, uh, it or not, it should not have infrastructure concerns. Okay? These concerns belong in their own layers. All right? And that is what layered architectures are, are all about. It's all about single responsibility principle. And single responsibility principle basically says, identify uh, for each object, do the one thing that it, it is supposed to specialize in. Okay, you're not supposed to have generalist objects. You're supposed to have specialist objects. 
So these are, in, in general, for almost all enterprise applications, in fact, uh, even outside of enterprise applications, these are, by and large, uh, the layers that you'll, you'll, be, um, you'll be looking at. Excuse me a second, I need to get a drink of water. Okay, so the interface part of this is actually relatively straightforward. The interface is anything that interacts with something else, okay, other than your external system. So think about these are the things that are at your system boundaries, okay? This is the thing that interacts with the user. The most obvious one of this is going to be, well, your UI, okay? So all of your entire UI logic belongs in the interface layer. And by the way, the interface layer will generally use its own design patterns. What is a popular one that you would use? MVC, yeah? So MVC would be a des design pattern that you would use in your interface layer. layer. However, that is not the only, only thing that actually belongs in the interface layer. What, what are some others you think? Other than a UI. If, pardon? The remote API. Okay, so a web service also belongs in the, in, the, in the interface layer, okay, because that is also dealing with a user. In this case, the user is another system or another machine, right? So those sort of concerns actually do not belong your, in your domain layer either, okay? Those are all things that belong in the interface layer, okay? So the interface layer is sort of, sort of a facade over the core of your system. The other one uh, is the application layer. Now, here's, here's where things get, get a little bit complex. Remember we talked about uh, coordination? Okay, how do you coordinate uh, between objects? How do you coordinate between a repository and an aggregate and an entity and a value object? Well, this is what this layer is for. It is called the application layer. It actually, design, it, it actually models the core API of your system. It's, uh, these are basically the, if, you're, if you showed somebody uh, your application layer and you showed it to a business analyst, they would understand, hey, this maps to uh, the high level uh, use cases that I have for my system. Okay, and its purpose in life is to simply uh, act as a coordination layer. Okay, that's what it does. Now, this is actually a very convenient place to do things like cro all kinds of cross-cutting functions. Okay, uh, transactions are the most obvious one. Security is another because it's a it's a natural point to say, okay, these are the primary operations in my system. Who is actually uh, able to perform these operations? All right, and below that you have your domain model, right? The domain, the stuff that we talked about in prior. Now, all throughout these guys, okay, you will have bits and pieces of infrastructure. So anything that is interacting with your framework, let's say, or, or your system uh, that is provi that's providing you services, infrastructure, infrastructure services, those all belong to all of these layers. Okay? And by and large, in Java E, for example, you would attach those, those bits of infrastructure declaratively through annotations. And I'll show you an example of what this is. Okay, mm, sorry. Okay, now let's bring it down to uh, something. Uh, oh, okay, uh, let me, before I move, move on there, any questions on any, any, anything oh, in layered architectures? Yes, sir. So re repositories clearly belong in um, your domain model, right? It's a core part of your domain model. Uh, the Im but the implementation of uh, a, a repository actually is a bit of infrastructure. So the code itself, the implementation of a repository is, an, is, is a bit of infrastructure. So there can be similar examples as well. For example, you can have infrastructure in your application as well. Logging is an example. Right? So if you, do, if you do any logging, you generally will want to do logging in the application layer or the infrastructure layer or the interface layer. Any other questions on uh, on layered architectures? No. No, by and large, no. So the the implementation of a logging should probably be a utility class, but the act of logging, okay, is going to be across all of these things. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Let's move on. All right, so now let's begin to uh, talk about this in, in uh, somewhat more concrete terms. And I think uh, this will begin to uh, give you the applied part of it. So technologies that you would generally use in the interface layer. Okay, obviously JSF is one. 
JAXRS is another that we talked about. Things like WebSocket, things like JBatch, all of these things are, are belong in the interface layer. Okay? These are interacting with some external system. These are triggers for your domain model, if you, if you want to think of it that way. And the application layer is, by and large, going to be stateless CJBs. Okay? They're, they're a very good way of implementing, uh, implementing the action layer, because they're automatically transactional, they're automatically secure, they're automatically monitored. Okay, if you're going to do monitoring, the best place to do monitoring of your application is at the application layer. Okay? Um, entities, by and large, actually have a direct relationship okay, uh, in, in JPA via JPA entities. A JPA entity is really nothing much more than an exact implementation of the entity pattern in domain-driven design. Okay? Similarly, value objects have a direct counterpart in JPA with JPA embeddables. Okay, JPA embeddables are exactly what, what, what value objects are intended to be. They're supposed to be composable parts of your, of your domain model. Um, similarly, the infrastructure bit is going to be pretty much all of Java EE. Okay, so anything that uh, gives you some kind of container services, bits of infrastructure. Some specific examples would be things like JPA. Okay, this gives you access to your database. JMS, to your message-oriented middleware. A JAXRS client. Uh, an external JAXRS endpoint, um, a EJB or a JAXWS client. Again, these are all bits of infrastructure, okay, things you're calling outside, of your, outside of, of your system that you are consuming. Repos repositories, by and large, um, are actually um, modeled by uh, JPA entity managers and CDIs, CDI beans. Okay? The implementation is going to be essentially CDI managed bean. They do not need to be EJBs, uh, but the actual code is actually going to be impl mostly imp implemented in the JPA Entity Manager. Okay. And I think that is pretty much all I want to talk about. So whatever technology you're using, you can sort of make a, make a rough analogy okay, to, to how, it, how it may look like. All right. Now let's uh, move on, on to uh, another step and actually look at um, some actual concrete code. Okay. This is actually the best way that you're going to um, begin to understand domain-driven design. So this is what I did. Uh, I actually wrote up a Java E 7 application okay, and applied domain-driven design to it. Okay. So you can actually see how does domain-driven design look like in a, in a real-life application. Okay. The application you can find at cargotracker.java.net. All right. Uh, I'll show you a brief, uh, I'll, I'll walk you through the, the uh, website really briefly, but basically what you can do is you can go onto that website, you can download the code examples, you can run them on your own machine, and you can begin to explore you know, how, uh, how domain-driven design looks like and how domain-driven design in particular looks like in a Java E implementation. Okay? So I'll show you a little bit of uh, the application, not too much, because I don't think I have that much time left. Can somebody do a time check for me, please? How much time do I have left? 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. Actually, that's, that's a good enough time. So here's the cargo tracker application. Okay. I have it up and running on my machine. Uh, it happens to be running in Glassfish. Um, you can run it on Wildfly or WebLogic if you want. Basically, what it does is that it is designed to model cargo across, going across the world on ships. Okay, so let's take a look at a basic uh, feature set of this application. So uh, there's a public tracking interface. This is where you know, a customer has, uh, has uh, registered a bit of cargo with you. Okay? Uh, and now he wants to find out, okay, what is happening with my cargo? Right? So let's just enter some values here. So A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. Well, we can see that, okay, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3 is currently in New York, and these are the things that have happened to it. It originated in Hong Kong, uh, was, loaded, was loaded in Hong Kong, was unloaded in New York. Okay. Similarly, we can do another one. Okay, another one. This happens to be misdirected. Okay, so some, some, it has misrouted in some way, but you get the basic idea. You can basically get some information about your current status. There is also uh, an administrative interface. Okay, and this basically is a view of uh, a dashboard view of okay, this is you know what is happening across my across my entities. Okay, all 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 of my data. There's a map version of this. Okay, this gives you some information about okay where your cargo is today. You can hover over it uh, if you want. Uh, you can go ahead and book a bit of cargo. Let me just go ahead and do that. Okay, so uh, let me say okay, my cargo is coming from. 
uh, let's say New York to uh, let's say it goes to Tokyo. Uh, I want to say it uh, is arrive is going to arrive by uh, December 27th, uh, 73 days. I'll go ahead and book it. Okay, I'm going back to the interface. This is my newly created cargo. I can go ahead and try to route it. Okay, I'll get several routing options because I know what my voyages are. Okay, so I can map out for you know for this uh, date range and location. These are the different ways I can send the cargo. Uh, I'll just pick one at random, and so on. Okay, so you get the basic idea of, of the application. Actually, there is a, a bit more to it. There's also a, a mobile interface. Okay, that you can. Um, it, this is responsive design. Okay, this is, uh, and you can enter in. Okay, what is actually happening to this cargo? You know, I received a bit of cargo from this port, or I unloaded it and loaded it on, and so on and so forth. Okay. So that's uh, about all I want to do in terms of a walkthrough of the application. Now let's take a look at the code. Okay. So first thing I want to do is show you the directory structure. So um, can you guess how big this application is? It's a lines of code. Yeah. Neighborhood. Any guesses? It's actually more like fifteen thousand. 15,000 lines of code. So this is a non-trivial application. If you're, if you're going to uh, be a, somebody that is brought on onto, into this application, you will have some learning to do, okay? So the, your first trend is actually the way, so the, you, you begin to see how domain-driven design really helps you out, okay? So although this is a very large application, you actually have a general idea of what this application does and where to look. Okay, because of its directory structure, and this is what we're, uh, where essentially layered architectures are coming into play. Okay, so you can see that there is an application layer, so you can expect that the high-level functionality, the high-level business uh, uh, use cases, would be modeled here. Okay, you can expect that there is a domain object, and this is where your domain implementations are. Okay. You can see that the uh, domain is actually broken up into subdomains, right? So there is cargo, handling, location, voyage, okay, these are what? Going back to our, these are aggregates, that's correct. Yeah, and these are essentially aggregates. Uh, and you can also see that I have some infrastructure pieces, okay, things that I'm, I'm doing uh, here, and then there are these interfaces, right? So if you look down here, these are all of the in types of interfaces that I have. Okay, so this is one way that uh, that essentially domain-driven design, and in particular layering, is helping you out. So let's dig in into our application a little bit more. A nice place to start, I think, is uh, the application layer. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So this is my booking service. This is actually the service that I was using uh, in my uh, in my admin UI. Okay, uh, in the admin application. So as you can see, I have four high-level, uh, and let me. Sorry, let me get rid of this so you can take a look at it a little bit better. So this is my, this is, uh, my booking service. This is essentially describing the high-level use cases of the system, okay, of, of a particular subsystem, uh, pardon me, namely the admin UI. Okay? So as you can see, I have um, functionality to book a new cargo, like, exactly like I did in, in my, in my uh, UI. There is functionality for uh, requesting possible routes for a cargo. I also showed, showed you that. Okay, you can assign cargo to a route. That's when what happened when I hit selected one one of those guys. Okay, and finally you have change destination, which I didn't show you. It's also a bit of functionality. Uh, given a particular routed cargo, you can change its destination. Okay, so these are the high-level uh, services uh, that are that I that I um, uh, make myself available of. Okay, and this is essentially the application layer. So now let's uh, dig a little bit more and take a look at the implementation of this. Okay. So this is implemented as a stateless session bean. Okay. All of those uh, methods are uh, transactional. Okay. Hence, I'm all on my, in my EJB, all of these implementations are automatically transactional. Okay. They are also secured. Uh, and they're monitored. If I log on onto the Glassfish console, I'll be able to see how many times uh, the service was invoked, 
uh, you know, how many, what, what were the average response time and all that stuff. So it's a really uh, good play. This is the purpose of the real, real purpose of the application domain. Other than making it accessible to you and understandable to you, it's also a great place to attach um, the primary uh, infrastructure bit, bits that you need, declarative infra infrastructure bits that you need. Okay. Let's read into it a little bit more. So it is interacting. Uh, it needs a, it, it is inter interacting with a bunch of repositories, cargo and location in this case. It is injecting uh, a service, okay, so this is an implementation of a service, okay. So there's your, uh, your core business domain. So what were, this one is, was what? Can you guess what this does? You've looked at the application, right? What was one of the key, m most complex things that you saw? Finding the route. Yeah, yeah, given a source and destination and a deadline, find the route. So that's, a, that's a actually a first class, uh, first class citizen of, of our business domain, and hence it's actually modeled through a routing service, a distinct service on its own right. Okay? And of course I'm doing logging here. All right, so now let's take a look at uh, an example of doing something. So let's say, uh, okay, Let, let's take a look at an uh, implementation of of assigned route to cargo, for example, okay? So let's take a look at this code. So in this particular code, what am I doing? I'm finding, I have an itinerary <coughs> <coughs> and a tracking ID. Uh, we're using the tracking ID, I'm finding the cargo through a repository, okay? I'm assigning the itinerary that, I, that I've been passed to to this cargo, okay? Assigned route to cargo and then I'm storing this, uh, this out, okay? I'm persisting this change. So this has changed the state of my domain, okay? And I'm changing, uh, I'm storing this state change into, onto, onto the database. Is there any business logic here? No, right? But in a traditional, if, you were, if this was to be modeled in uh, the J2E design patterns, the business logic would actually be here. So the logic of assigning, uh, assigned route to cargo would not actually exist in the cargo domain, it would exist here, okay? So uh, now let's dig one, one level deeper. Uh, and by the way, similarly, you'll see other, other things as well here. So this is another example of m even more, co more uh, sort of collaboration and orchestration, okay? So that is the purpose of the application there. It's not to model business logic, it's simply to perform orchestration, okay? To make the, to make the entities in the domain model and the value objects work with each other. Yes, sir. No. No, not at all. So that's, let's dig in into that next. So now let's uh, take a look at uh, the cargo domain. Okay. Uh, and let me control click on that. Uh, rather, let me just actually, actually navigate to its um, go to implementation. Okay. So this is the cargo domain object. Let's take a look at this domain object a little bit later. Okay. Um, for now, let's just uh, focus on this assign route to cargo method, okay? So this is, in fact, not just a, a setter at all, okay? So if you look at uh, the delivery object, okay, if I look at uh, update on cargo routing, sh let me show you the implementation of that. Okay, so notice what is going on here, right? So we've nested several places, right? So there's quite a bit of assignment and state changes that are going on, right? And finally, look at what, all of what is going on here. Okay, there's a bunch of calculation going on and a bunch of state changes going on. So this is all of your business logic, okay? All of the business logic that you would implement, implemented otherwise, implemented this way, okay? So this is giving you all of the OO properties that you need. It's not just about, uh, not, not just about modeling a data, okay? So if you go back and take a look at my cargo object, okay? My R cargo object is actually an entity. It's a JPA entity. It is actually an entity in my, in my object. There's certainly some, some uh, data to it, like the long ID and the embedded tracking ID. By the way, what is this? This is a value object, okay? This does not have an identity on its own. It's an, it's an embeddable object. Okay. Similarly, I have another one called route specification. Okay. This is also uh, an, an, and, uh, an, a value object. Let me show you this. Okay. It's an embeddable. 
All right? It does not have an ID on its own, but it ma helps you map data. Okay, it's a, compose, it's a compose, composition relationship. So a cargo has a route specification. Okay, this is helping you manage the complexity of your domain okay, through modeling it using object orientation. More importantly, uh, there's getters on setters. Okay, but beyond getters on setters, uh, look what's going on here. Specify new route, assign to route. Derived delivery progress, this is all business logic. Okay, so it is both data and, law and behavior modeled together in an entity. It's not simply a, a dumb data holder. It's much more than that. Okay, and that is actually the core of, of domain-driven design. Okay, if you're, this is the core thing that you're trying to accomplish in the end. Now, let's take a look at uh, the cargo domain sort of in its context for a second. So uh, let me expand this back out. Cargo actually has its own uh, aggregate, okay? So it is actually a constellation, if you will, a cargo constellation. If I uh, expanded this out, you'll see that there's actually a whole bunch of other things uh, going on here, okay? There is uh, the uh, cargo ob object itself, there's a cargo repository, there's a delivery object handling activity, all of these other things. Okay, all of them are actually related to uh, the, the cargo constellation. Okay, these are things that are interrelated to each other. Similarly, uh, if you looked at uh, location, for example, okay, it also has sort of its own constellation. Okay, there's a location and the location repository, and then um, UN low code and the like. Now, note back here, the cargo entity. How many repositories are there? Just one. Okay, representing this entire aggregate, right? So that's, that's where the that's where again aggregates are uh, are coming into play for you. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the interfaces. How much time do I have? Okay. Notice that there is distinct types of inter interfaces. Okay, so I have a booking interface. I have a handling interface, okay, this have, and handling interface has a mobile element to it, a file element to it, this is actually a file processor, a batch job. I have a REST web service, okay? So these are all different types, and there's obviously also there is a web, web interface as well. So various types of interfaces um, sort of grouped together on their, on the, in their own place, okay, using uh, domain-driven design and layered architectures in particular. Okay, and I think that's, uh, is there anything else anyone would like to see out of this? Otherwise, I'm going to move on and go back to my slide deck. Uh, Precisely, yes. Yep. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yes. Correct. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Yep. Anything else you'd like to see? Of course, you can explore this code base yourself uh, afterward. Okay. Uh, so, one thing I didn't get into is that domain-driven design has a concept called bounded context. Uh, bounded context actually has much to do with uh, with with microservices. Okay. So this is actually a microservice. Pathfinder is a microservice. Okay, so uh, domain, in domain-driven design, we've been doing microservices for almost 10 years. Okay, so all of those concepts that are in bounded context have, are a perfect fit to microservices. Okay, anything else? Yes, sir. Domain shared. Oh, this is just uh, utility classes for uh, that are shared across the domain. Nothing much more. You can think of it as framework classes. Yeah, there are some utilities here as well. You see, no, you notice there is an application utility a uh, util as well, right? So there, there's places for utilities as well. They're, they they would be considered part of the infrastructure essentially. Okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Yes, so um, by and large, I actually do uh, uh, something called a join fetch. Okay, in, in JPA, there's a specific construct called a join fetch. So this, the, in this application, there's not examples of it, but this is a good question, because what happens is, um, finders are very complicated. Right? In most applications, there's, there's not just one find operation. There's actually multiple finders, different types of queries that you, that you, uh, that you execute to get different parts of an aggregate. Okay? So by and large, what I do is I have different finders, find, and then some description of what that finder is. And then usually I implemented using, uh, I used to actually implement it using join fetch. Okay, so I would, uh, I would get particular parts, the parts of the, precise parts of, of the aggregate that I need, or domain that I need. Um, now actually there's uh, a, another uh, a very uh, good feature introduced in JPA 2.1 called a query plan. Okay, and it gives you exactly that. You can, you can describe your exact query plan. You don't have to write it in uh, JPQL. You can actually configure it in annotations, and it, it will give you uh, exact parts of the domain that you need. So that's a very good question. So by and large, that's how I do it. I, I never use lazy, lazy loading at all, uh, because it just doesn't work reliably. And especially if you're going through a DTO facade, you, know, you no longer have an active transaction to do uh, lazy loading. So you'll get a bunch of lazy instantiation exceptions. OK. Yes, sir. You don't have to. Uh, I prefer to do it because I like my UI to be stateless. I don't, I don't like to bloat up my, um, my memory space. If I was to do that, I would have to put in a bunch of very heavyweight objects in either uh, session state or view state. Okay, so I prefer not to do that. I prefer to just do, uh, just to pass around just IDs and then hydrate, you know, my domain objects on each page instead. Okay, yes sir. Okay, all right, I'm running short of time, so we need to move on, okay. Uh, all right, so let me exit my IDE, and let's move on on to, my slideshow, okay. So, okay, so check out the application. Um, it should have a, a lot more information on it. There's also a write-up on, on the application and domain-driven design. Um, just to summarize, um, I definitely am a big believer in domain-driven design. I definitely think you should adopt it. I think it's a shame. It's not, as, it's not more ad well adopted than it is um, today, so I hope that changes. Um, if you want to get, get Java E, is actually a very natural fit, as you'll see, as you saw in the application. Okay, there's nothing stopping you from using do all domain-driven domain co constructs. In fact, Java E helps you, especially uh, JPA helps you quite a bit in terms of domain modeling. Um, so a great place to start, of course, is a, is a cargo tracker application. Okay, so this is the most important thing that I wanted to I have time to discuss. These are the resources that are available to you to learn domain-driven design. Okay, so first of all is obviously the application. Let me advise you, do not read uh, Eric Evans' book. Okay, uh, read er Eric Evans' book after a little while. Okay, after you get a basic understanding of domain-driven design, then go read Eric Evans' book. In the meanwhile, what you can do is that there's a very nice dzone ref card. Okay, it's literally five pages. And it will summarize for you uh, almost exactly what I said okay, in, during this talk. There's also uh, another book from InfoQ, uh, a mini book called Domain Driven Design Quickly. It's a very thin book. It's about, let's say, 100 pages. Okay, so that should be the next thing you should read uh, to give you a better idea of domain driven design. Uh, and finally, if you want to learn anything about Java E, uh, I definitely recommend uh, the official Java E 7 tutorial. Okay, so thank you very much. I have one more minute left. I will take any questions. Otherwise, uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>